Welcome to this tutorial for SARS Global Forum 2020. I'm Guo Hui Wu at SARS. In this tutorial, we will talk about spatial econometric modeling. I would like to start this tutorial with two questions. My first question is, why spatial data analysis? First, we need to consider spatial data analysis because spatial data is abundant in many applications. For spatial data, we can associate observations in the data with different points or regions in space. When data are collected from different points or regions in space, nearby observations tend to be correlated, as described by the first law of geography, which says everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. From the modeling point of view, the first law of geography suggests the need to account for spatial dependence when analyzing spatial data. While classical regression methods are widely used in many data analyses, they rely on the assumption that observations are independent from each other. This assumption of independence, however, is often unrealistic for spatial data. Moreover, ignoring spatial dependence in the data can lead to biased parameter estimates and flawed inference. Spatial data analysis, on the other hand, aims to account for spatial dependence in the data to ensure that the resulting parameter estimates and inference are correct. My second question is about big data. In general, the definition for big data differs from one area to another. For example, big data could mean the number of observations in the data is large. It could also mean the number of variables in the data is large. As far as results are concerned, our goal is to realize big values from the data so that we can turn data into actionable insights. To uncover hidden values from big data, we need software packages with desirable functionality and scalability to empower us. In this tutorial, we will discuss some challenges posed by big spatial data and introduce two SAS procedures for spatial econometric modeling. This tutorial is organized as follows. We will start with a brief introduction to the classical linear regression model and explain why it fails to model spatial data. Building on this, we will introduce spatial econometric modeling, covering key points including spatial weight matrix, or the correlation tests, and a unified modeling framework. Then, we will introduce two such procedures developed for spatial econometric modeling, proxy spatial reg and prox spatial reg. Examples will be presented to demonstrate the syntax and the usage of these two procedures. Lastly, we will conclude this tutorial with a summary. Let's start with the classical linear regression model. In a multiple linear regression model, we assume a linear relationship between the dependent variable y and some independent variables. This linear relationship can be described by the equation yi equals xi beta plus epsilon i, where beta is the vector of regression coefficients. The random error terms epsilon i are assumed to be uncorrelated and have a mean zero and constant variance sigma square. Another two key assumptions are independence and normality. Importantly, the normality assumption is only needed for inference. For interpretation, the regression coefficient beta q measures the direct impact of an explanatory variable xq on the dependent variable y. Because changes in an xq for the j's observation do not affect yi if i is not equal to j, an explanatory variable xq does not have an indirect impact on y. Although the classical linear regression model is often used, it is not suitable for modeling spatial data. First, the key assumptions of uncorrelated errors and independent observations for linear regression models can be violated by spatial data due to spatial dependence. In addition, spatial data often exhibits spillover effects, allowing an explanatory variable to have indirect impacts on the dependent variable. When the assumptions break down, the estimates and inference from the classical linear regression model can be biased and misleading. On the one hand, ignoring spatial lag dependence or endogenous interaction effect leads to biased 
and inconsistent parent estimates. As a result, the inference based on these estimates will be incorrect. On the other hand, ignoring spatial error dependence or correlated errors leads to unbiased yet inefficient estimators. In this case, since the estimates for the standard errors associated with the parameters are biased, any resulting inferences such as t-tests and f-tests will be biased. Spatial econometric models account for various forms of spatial dependence in the data to ensure that the resulting parameter estimates and inference are correct. The key message here is that ignoring spatial dependence comes with substantial risks, which is why we introduce spatial econometric modeling in this tutorial. Before we talk about spatial econometric modeling, we will first introduce three types of spatial data. They are aerial data, point pattern data, and point reference data. For aerial data, the target variable YSI is an aggregated value over some finite and fixed area units with well-defined boundaries. For point pattern data, our target variable YSI often refers to the occurrence of certain event at some random location SI. Different from aerial data, the locations at which we observe data are random and not fixed. For point pattern data analysis, the focus is on whether certain event of interest is equally distributed over space or not. In other words, we are interested in the distribution of locations. For point reference data, our target variable YSI is a random realization of a spatial process at some location SI. These locations SI vary continuously over some spatial domain. Moreover, the focus is on inference about the properties of a spatial process, for example, stationarity, and on predictions for unobserved locations. In this tutorial, we will focus on spatial econometric modeling for aerial data. Next, some background information about spatial econometrics. Spatial econometrics is a subfield of econometrics that deals with spatial interaction and heterogeneity in regression models for cross-sectional and panel data. Spatial econometric models extend standard econometric models by including spatial components into the models to account for spatial interaction and heterogeneity. Two key components in spatial econometric modeling are spatial weight matrix and model specification. According to the first law of geography, data collected across different units in space are often correlated, and the strength of such dependence is determined by the proximity of two spatial units. In spatial econometric modeling, we use a spatial weight matrix, often known as W matrix, to describe the proximity of two spatial units. In SAS, there are two procedures for spatial econometric modeling, the C-spatial rug procedure and the spatial rug procedure. Spatial weights matrix W plays an important role in spatial econometric modeling. On the one hand, we use W matrix to describe neighbor relationships among observation units. In many practical applications, W is an n by n matrix with non-negative entries, where n is the number of spatial units in the data. Wij, or the ij's entry of W, is positive if units i and j are neighbors. By convention, the diagonal elements of W are all zeros because a spatial unit is not considered a neighbor of itself. On the other hand, we use W matrix to parameterize spatial dependence in spatial econometric modeling. In practice, W matrix is often row standardized. Next, we discuss how to test for spatial autocorrelation or spatial dependence using both Morin's I test and the Gary C test. Morin's I statistic is defined by the first equation on this slide. In this equation, n is the number of spatial units in the data, w is a spatial weight matrix, and y is the variable of interest. Moreover, y bar is the mean of y. As we can see, the numerator in Morin's I statistic involves the cross product between the deviation of each observation yi from the mean and the deviation of neighboring yj's from the mean. Under the null hypothesis of no spatial autocorrelation, the expected value of i is negative 1 over n minus 1, which goes to 0 for large n. The test score zi is given by the second equation here. 
Asymptotically, ZI follows the standard normal distribution. To compute ZI, we need to compute the variance of I, which is often determined under the assumption of normality and randomization. Under the normality assumption, we assume that the variable Y follows the normal distribution, whereas for the randomization assumption, we assume that the values of Y are equally distributed over the spatial domain. To interpret Moran's I, we compute a Z-score and p-value. When p-value is significant, a positive Z-score indicates positive autocorrelation, whereas a negative Z-score indicates negative autocorrelation. For Gary's C-test, the test statistic is defined by the first equation given here. According to this equation, Gary's C-test statistic uses squared difference of neighboring values and is always non-negative. Same as for Moran's I test, the test score for Gary's C test also follows the standard normal distribution asymptotically. Under the null hypothesis, the expected value of C is 1. Similar to Moran's I, the variance of C can be computed under the assumption of normality or randomization. To interpret Gary's C, a C value significantly less than 1 indicates positive autocorrelation whereas a C value significantly greater than 1 indicates negative autocorrelation. This is contrary to Moran's I test, where a significant and positive Moran's I index indicates positive autocorrelation, and a significant and negative Moran's I index indicates a negative autocorrelation. As a result, Gary C is often said to be inversely related to Moran's I. Moran's I and Gary C tests share some similarities. First, neither of these two tests is a model specification diagnostic. What this means is that when we reject the null hypothesis of spatial randomness, neither Moran's I or Gary C test tells us which model should be used to address spatial dependence in the data. Second, both Moran's I and Gary C tests depend on the spatial weights matrix that we choose. The test results can be sensitive to different choices of spatial weights matrix. Although test scores in both tests follow the standard normal distribution asymptotically, results are not robust when the sample size is small. Despite these similarities, there are some major differences between these two tests. On the one hand, Moran's I computes the cross product between the deviation of neighboring observations from the mean, whereas Gary C computes the squared difference of neighboring observations. Since mean is sensitive to extreme values, Moran's I test is sensitive to outliers. On the other hand, Moran's I test focuses on global autocorrelation, whereas Gary C test focuses on local autocorrelation. Neither Moran's I or Gary C test is a model specification diagnostic. Therefore, a natural question to ask is which model should we pick to account for spatial dependence in the data? To answer this question, we now discuss a unified framework for spatial econometric modeling. In spatial econometric modeling, spatial dependence can arise from three different sources, exogenous interaction effect, endogenous interaction effect, and the interaction among the errors. For exogenous interaction effect, the value of the dependent variable y for unit i depends on the value of an explanatory variable x in another unit j. For endogenous interaction effect, the value of y for unit i depends on the value of y in another unit j. Lastly, the interaction among errors means that errors in different units are correlated. The understanding of different forms of spatial dependence is crucial for spatial econometric modeling. This unified modern framework can help us understand many spatial econometric models that we will discuss later. To prepare data for spatial econometric modeling, we need to obtain geographic information for spatial units in the data. For example, geographic coordinates such as longitude and latitude values. To manage and manipulate spatial data, we can use the geographic information system or some procedures in SAS. As an example, the geocode procedure in SAS enables us to add geographic coordinates to an address. With some geographic information, we can determine how observation units in the data 
are spatially related. For example, longitude and latitude values can be used to compute the distance between two units, which can then be used to determine their neighbor relationships. In spatial econometric modeling, we use a spatial width matrix to describe how observation units are spatially related. After preparing the data, we can proceed with model specification and model fitting. Now, we demonstrate how to convert an address to longitude and latitude values using PROC geocode in SAS. As an example, we consider a dataset named customers, which includes four variables address, zip, city, and state. In this dataset, the variable address refers to street address, and the variable zip refers to zip code. The other two variables, city and state, refers to the name of a city and a state, respectively. Each observation in the data refers to a location that can be identified by the street address, zip code, and both the city and the state names. The lower right panel shows you the SAS code using PROC geocode. The method equals street option specifies the street geocoding method. The lookup street equal option specifies street matching data set. With street geocoding method, the geocode procedure first attempts to match the street name and zip code. If it fails, the geocode procedure makes the second attempt to match the street name, city name, and state name. The data equal option specifies the input data set whose address observation that you want to geocode. The longitude and the latitude variables for the geocoded street location of the match will be added to the specified output data set. Next, we discuss how to create a spatial width matrix W for spatial econometric modeling. As we have already mentioned, the spatial width matrix W describes neighbor relationships among observation units in the data. In its simplest form, you can think of a spatial width matrix as a binary matrix, with one to represent a neighbor relationship between two units, and zero otherwise. To determine if two units are neighbors or not, we need some neighbor criteria. In practice, neighbor criteria can be based on contiguity, distance, and many more factors. In the next few slides, some examples will be given to show how to create a spatial weight matrix based on the contiguity and distance criteria. First, we talk about k-order contiguity matrix based on the contiguity criterion. For the contiguity criterion being discussed here, two units are neighbors if they share a common border. For k-order binary contiguity matrix C, the ij entry of C or Cij is 1 if units i and j are k-order neighbors and 0 otherwise. For k equals 1, we have first-order neighbors. In this case, Cij is 1 if units i and j share a common border and 0 otherwise. For the general case where k is greater than 1, we say unit j is a k-order neighbor of unit i if unit j is a neighbor of k-1-order neighbors of unit i. As an example, consider the graph on the left panel. In this graph, five spatial units are labeled from L1 to L5. For unit L1, it has two first-order neighbors, L2 and L4, because both L2 and L4 share a common border with L1. As a result, for the spatial contiguity matrix C shown on the bottom, both the second and fourth element in the first row of the matrix C is 1, and the rest is 0. For unit L2, it has two first-order neighbors, L1 and L5, because both L1 and L5 share a common border with L2. Accordingly, the first and the fifth element in the second row of the matrix C is 1, and the rest is 0. Similarly, we can figure out the remaining elements in the matrix C. Based on this contiguity matrix C, we can get a row standardized spatial weight matrix W by dividing elements in each row of the matrix C by the sum of that row. The key to creating first-order spatial contiguity matrix is to identify spatial units that share a common border. The example presented on this slide shows how to create a list of 
North Carolina counties that share a common border using SARS. We start by creating a map dataset for all counties in North Carolina. In step one, we create a map dataset named map underscore NC for all counties in North Carolina using a SARS supplied map dataset named counties. This SARS supplied map dataset contains geographic information for all counties in the US. In the where statement, we use the FIPS state code of 37 to select only North Carolina counties. After step one is completed, the dataset map underscore NC has the mapping information for all counties in North Carolina, including longitude and latitude values. In step two, we create a variable x underscore y as a string representation of longitude and latitude pair corresponding to each observation in the dataset map underscore nc. Next, we identify two neighboring counties that share a common border by using the variable x underscore y. The idea is that for two counties sharing a common border, the variable x underscore y corresponding to points on the common boundary will have duplicate values. Building on this idea, we first sort the data set created in step 2 by the variable x underscore y using proc sort, and the resulting sorted data is written to a new data set named temp. With the no dupe key and dupe out options, and in duplicate observations that have the same values for the x underscore y variable will be written to a new data set named border underscore long that, but eliminated from the data set temp. By matching values of the variable x underscore y in the two data sets named border underscore long that and temp, using proc SQL, we create a new table named bordering A, which contains a list of counties that share a common border. The remaining proc SQL code is to ensure that neighbor relationship defined by the contiguity criterion is symmetric. Next, we discuss k nearest neighbor spatial weights matrix based on some distance criterion. In this case, we need to define some distance measure to compute the distance between two spatial units. For example, a distance measure could be Euclidean distance or geodetic distance, computed using the longitude and latitude coordinates of two units. The right panel shows how to create a k nearest neighbor weight matrix C step by step. In step one, we begin by computing pairwise distance dij between a spatial unit i and any other unit j. In step 2, we sort dij's in ascending order. Then, we get the set of k nearest neighbors for unit i in step 3. In step 4, we set the ijth entry in the weight matrix C, cij, to be 1 if j is one of the k closest units to i and 0 otherwise. Unlike contiguity-based neighbor relationships that are symmetric, neighbor relationships based on a k-nearest neighbor criterion are not guaranteed to be symmetric. This is because the neighbor relationship based on the k-nearest neighbor criterion is directional. There are a few such procedures that you can use to create a k-nearest neighbor spatial weights matrix. This slide shows two examples. The first example shows how to obtain a list of k-nearest neighbors using PROC mode class. The mode class procedure clusters observation in an input data set using some nonparametric density estimation based algorithms. The second example shows how to use PROC distance to compute the distance between observations in a data set based on proximity measures such as Euclidean distance, shape distance, and many more. You can refer to the user documentation of these two procedures for more information. If you want to create a spatial weights matrix based on some customized neighbor criterion, SAS IML can be used. Now we discuss two challenges posed by big data for spatial econometric modeling. By big data, we mean the number of observations n is large. Memory-wise, it could take a lot of memory to store a full W matrix, especially if n is large. For example, it takes about 30 gigabytes of memory to store a full W matrix for 65,000 US census tracts. Computation-wise, 
The maximum likelihood estimation for spatial geometric models requires the inverse and the log determinant of some n by n matrix. This computation becomes prohibitive for large n. To reduce storage cost, we can use compact representation of the W matrix. This compact representation of the W matrix stores only non-zero weights in the W matrix. The use of compact representation is advantageous when the W matrix is sparse, which is often the case in many practical applications. To resolve computational challenges for big data, two approximation methods, Taylor approximation and Chebyshev approximation, can be used to speed up computation. The key to the compact representation of the W matrix is to store only its non-zero weights together with their indices. You can think of the compact representation of the W matrix as a matrix with the number of rows being the number of non-zero weights in the W matrix, and the number of columns being three. One of these three columns stores those non-zero weights, whereas the other two columns store the row and column indices corresponding to non-zero weights. As an example, we consider the row standardized spatial weight matrix W discussed before. For the first row of the W matrix corresponding to unit L1, there are two non-zero weights, both of which are 0.5. These two non-zero weights corresponding to weights carried by units L2 and L4 on unit L1. As a result, the first two rows in the compact representation of W matrix reads L1, L2, 0 0.5, and L1, L4, 0 0.5. Comparing the full W matrix with its compact representation to the right, we see that the compact representation avoids storing many zero elements in the W matrix. As the W matrix gets sparse, using compact representation can significantly reduce the storage cost. In addition, using compact representation also reduces computation time by eliminating operations on zero elements. The maximum likelihood estimation for spatial geometric models discussed in this tutorial requires the log determinant of a matrix of the form i minus rho times w, where i is an identity matrix, rho is a scalar parameter, and w is the spatial weights matrix. To resolve computational challenges posed by big data, we briefly introduce two methods for approximating the log determinant of i minus rho times w. First, for any square matrix A satisfying certain conditions, the log determinant of A equals the trace of the logarithm of A. Based on this, Taylor approximation for the required log determinant involves only computing the traces of powers of the W matrix. Whereas Chebyshev approximation for the required log determinant involves computing the traces of Chebyshev polynomials of the W matrix. Between these two approximation methods, Taylor approximation has a good local performance, whereas the Chebyshev approximation has a good uniform performance. These two approximations can speed up the computation significantly by reducing the problem of computing the log determinant of a large matrix to the problem of computing traces of the powers of the W matrix or Chebyshev polynomials of the W matrix. Now, let's talk about two such procedures for spatial econometric modeling. The table presented here includes all spatial econometric models supported by proxy spatial reg and prox spatial reg. To relate these models to the unified framework discussed before, endogenous interaction effects are accounted for by including spatially left dependent variable wy in the model. Moreover, Exogenous interaction effects are accounted for by including spatially lacked explanatory variables Wx in the model. In addition, interaction in the error terms are modeled using either an autoregressive or moving average model. All but one models presented in the table account for either one form of spatial dependence or a combination of the three forms. 
For example, spatial lack of X model accounts for only exogenous interaction effects by including spatially lacked explanatory variables in the model. Spatial autoregressive or SAR model accounts for endogenous interaction effects by including WY in the model. To account for correlated errors, both spatial moving average model and spatial error model can be used. Among these models, both SDAC and SDARMA models can be used to account for all three forms of spatial dependence. Although interaction in the error terms can be modeled using either a spatial moving average structure or spatial autoregressive structure, these two different structures have very different implications. As can be seen from these two error structures, the spatial moving average structure emphasizes low order neighbors, whereas the spatial autoregressive error structure emphasizes high order neighbors by including higher powers of the doubling matrix. Spatial dependence in the data not only violates the assumptions for the classical linear regression model, but also leads to different interpretation for parameters. In spatial econometric models, the direct, indirect, and the total impacts are used to measure the impacts of explanatory variables on the dependent variable. For the direct impact of explanatory variable xq, it is defined by the derivative of yi with respect to xiq. In spatial econometric models, changes in xiq may impact yi through a combination of within region and the neighborhood influence. The neighborhood influence arises from impacts passing through neighboring units and back to the unit itself. For the indirect impact of an explanatory variable xq, described by the derivative of yi with respect to xjq, measures the impact of a change in xjq from unit j on yi. In spatial econometric models, indirect impacts can arise from spillover effects. The total impact of an explanatory variable xq is the sum of the direct and indirect impacts of xq. The direct, indirect, and the total impacts vary with spatial units. As a result, the average of direct, indirect, and the total impact over all spatial units is used as a summary measure of the varying direct indirect, and total impact, respectively. Now consider spatial Durban model as an example. For this model, the derivative of yi with respect to xiq equals to the i's diagonal element of the matrix xqw, which depends on the parameter rho, regression coefficients beta q and gamma q and the spatial weights matrix W. For rho equals zero, spatial Durban model reduces to spatial lack of X model, and the direct impact of an explanatory variable XQ equals beta Q. However, if rho is not equal to zero, the direct impact of XQ varies with spatial units, and it is not equal to beta Q. As a result, for spatial econometric models that include spatial lag dependence, beta q cannot be interpreted as the direct impact of an explanatory variable xq on the dependent variable y. Similarly, for the indirect impact of an explanatory variable xq, the derivative of yi with respect to xjq equals to the ijth entry of the matrix xqw. For rho equals zero, the indirect impact of an explanatory variable xq equals gamma q. However, if rho is not equal to zero, the indirect impact of an explanatory variable xq is not gamma q. The take-home message from this slide is that for spatial econometric models include spatial lag dependence, parameters in the model have a very different interpretation from those in the classical linear regression model. We need a summary measures of the direct, indirect, 
and total impacts to quantify the varying impacts of changes in explanatory variable. The average direct impact measures the impact of changes in an explanatory variable xq in a given region on the dependent variable y in the same region. It is calculated as an average of the diagonal elements of the matrix sqw. The average total impact measures the total impact of changes in an explanatory variable xq in all regions on the dependent variable y of a typical region. It is calculated as an average of the sums of each row in the matrix SQW. The average indirect impact of XQ is the difference between the average total impact of XQ and the average direct impact of XQ. It measures the impact on Y of a given region arising from changes in XQ in all other regions. Now, let's talk about two procedures for spatial dimensional modeling in SAS. First, let's look at the syntax for proxy spatial rec. The C spatial rec procedure takes two input data tables. The data equal option names the primary data table. This primary input data table contains dependent variables, explanatory variables, and so on. The WMAT equal option names the secondary spatial weight data table which contains spatial weight information. We can provide either a full spatial weight matrix or the compact representation of a spatial weight matrix. The approximation equal option can choose options that are related to Taylor and Chebyshev approximation methods. We can use either the keyword Chebyshev or Taylor to specify an approximation method. By default, Chebyshev approximation is used. The impact equal option specifies options related to impact estimation. The model statement specifies the dependent variable and independent covariates for the regression model. The type equal option in the model statement specifies the type of a model. In addition, the spatial effects statement enables you to specify covariates for which spatially lagged variables will be created to account for exogenous interaction effects. Lastly, the spatial ID statement specifies an ID variable that identifies a spatial unit. The syntax for PROC spatial reg is very similar to that for PROC C spatial reg. Unlike PROC C spatial reg that supports only one model statement, we can have more than one model statement in PROC spatial reg. This is very useful because it allows us to fit many different spatial geometric models by calling PROC spatial rec only once. Although the spatial rec procedure and the C-spatial procedure have very similar syntax, there are some major differences between these two procedures. First, PROC C-spatial rec operates on multiple threads on multiple machines, whereas PROC spatial rec operates on a single machine. In terms of functionality, impact estimation is supported in PROC C spatial rec, but not in PROC spatial rec. In addition, multiple model statements are supported in PROC spatial rec, but not in PROC C spatial rec. Let's look at two examples. In the first example, we consider a simulated data set that contains car sales of some dealership in each of 100 counties in North Carolina. There are three variables in this simulated data set. The dependent variable y refers to revenue of each car dealership. Two explanatory variables are x1 and x2, both of which are important predictors for car sales revenue. For example, x1 and x2 might be standardized median household income and unemployment rate, respectively. For data generation, we first create a spatial weight matrix W for counties in North Carolina based on a contiguity criterion. Using this W matrix, we then simulate data from an SDAC model with two parameter values specified for the model. The values of X1 and X2 for each county are simulated from the standard normal distribution. 
For random error times epsilon i, they are simulated from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 0 0.2. There are three main goals that we want to achieve by analyzing the Castillo data set. First, we want to know whether car sales revenue of a car dealership in one county is affected by car sales revenue of car dealership in neighboring counties or not. Second, we want to identify a model that best describes the car sales data set using certain criterion. Third, we need to understand how the two explanatory variables x1 and x2 affect car sales revenue. Loosely speaking, the first and second goal is related to model specification and model selection respectively. The third goal, however, is about inference, or the interpretation of parameters in the model. We will demonstrate how to address these three analytical goals through spatial metric modeling using proxy spatial rag and proxy spatial rag. Before we fit a model to the car sales data set, we visualize the data by plotting car sales revenue for North Carolina counties on a map. From this plot, we can see that car sales revenue for neighboring counties seem to be similar, which is an indication of a positive autocorrelation in car sales revenue. To formally test spatial autocorrelation for car sales revenue in the car sales data set, we consider both Morin's I and Gary C tests. The table on the top shows the results from Morin's I test and both the normality and the randomization assumptions. Based on the p-values and the two assumptions, we reject the null hypothesis of zero spatial autocorrelation in car sales revenue at the 5% significance level. Furthermore, the positive z-scores indicate a positive autocorrelation. The second table shows the result from Gary C test and both the normality and the randomization assumptions. Based on the p-values and the two assumptions, we reject the null hypothesis of zero spatial autocorrelation in car sales revenue at the 5% significance level. In addition, Gary C index is less than 1 and both assumptions, which indicates a positive autocorrelation. To summarize, both Morin's I and Gary C tests suggest a positive spatial autocorrelation in car sales revenue across 100 North Carolina counties. Now, we fit two models to the car sales data set. The first model we fit is a linear regression model. This model includes two explanatory variables x1 and x2. The other model we fit is the true model, which is an SDAC model. The table on the left shows the parameter estimates from the linear regression model, whereas the table on the right shows the parameter estimates from the true model. From the parameter estimates table for the true model, we see that the estimate for parameter row is significantly different from zero at the 5% significance level. As a result, parameter estimates from the linear regression model on the left are biased and inconsistent. The bias in the parameter estimates from the linear regression model can be checked by comparing this parameter estimates with the true values. For example, the estimate for the intercept from the linear regression model is about 7.74, which is about twice as large as the true value of 3.0. Moreover, the estimate of the regression coefficient corresponding to x1 and x2 in the linear regression model is about 1.94 and negative 0.95 respectively which is larger than the respective true value of 1.5 and negative 0.6 in absolute value. Typically, non-spatial models tend to attribute variation in the dependent variable to the explanatory variables, leading to large parameter estimates in absolute value. 
to assess the impacts of the two explanatory variables x1 and x2, represent the average direct, indirect, and total impact estimates from proxy spatial rack. The two tables shown here are the parameter estimates table and impact estimate summary table from the true model. The comparison between these two tables show that the estimate of the regression coefficient for x1 is different from any of the three impact measures for x1. From the impact estimate summary table, we can see that both the direct and indirect impacts of x1 are positive and significant at the 5% significance level. This suggests that we would see increased cost sales revenue in counties experiencing an increase in X1. The indirect impact from X1 in neighboring counties is about twice as large as the direct impact, suggesting a large spillover impact from X1. The total impact of X1 is positive and significant at the 5% significance level with about two-thirds of the total impact contributed by the spillover effect from X1 in neighboring counties. Similarly, we can see that the direct and indirect impacts of X2 are all negative and significant at the 5% significance level. This suggests that we would see decreased cost of revenue in counties experiencing an increase in X2. The indirect impact from X2 in neighboring counties is about three times as large as the direct impact. This suggests that there is a large spillover impact from X2. The total impact of X2 is negative and significant at the 5% significance level, with about three-fourths of the total impact contributed by the spillover effect from X2 in neighboring counties. According to the impact estimate summary table, we can conclude that increasing X1 by one unit for all counties leads to a total increase in cost sales revenue by 5.6 units. Moreover, increasing X2 by one unit in all counties leads to a total decrease in cost sales revenue by 3.2 units. This slide shows the source code that was used to fit the true model for the CASIO dataset and to request the impact estimate summary table using proxy spatial rec. The use of type equal SAC option in the model statement, together with the spatial effects statement, specifies an SDAC model. The spatial ID statement specifies county name as the spatial ID variable. The test statement specifies a joint hypothesis row equals zero and lambda equals zero to be tested. In addition, the type equal word LR option in the test statement requests the joint hypothesis to be tested using both word and likelihood ratio tests. In the output statement, the out equal option names the output data table. The result equal prep equal and COPVAR equal option requests three observation-wise statistics, residue, fitted value, and the spatial ID variable to be included in the output data table, respectively. To select a model that best describes the CASIO data set, we consider model selection using the Akaikis Information Criteria, or AIC. We fit all 12 models supported in proxy spatial rag and the PROC spatial rack, with both X1 and X2 included as explanatory variables. The table on the left shows the AIC values for all 12 models being considered. Based on these AIC values, we conclude that the true model is the best model since its AIC value is the smallest. Among these 12 models, SD-ARMA model has the second smallest AIC value of 143.8. The main difference between SDAC and SD-ARMA model is that SDAC model uses a spatial or the regressive model for, for disturbance, whereas SD-ARMA model uses a spatial moving average model for disturbance. 
two tables on the right show the test results for the joint hypothesis rho equals zero and lambda equals zero from SDAC and SD armor models using both ward and likelihood ratio tests. Based on these test results, we reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level. This leads to the conclusion that there is some spatial dependence in the data. On this slide, we compare three summary measures of direct, indirect, and total impacts for two explanatory variables, x1 and x2, in both SDAC and SD armor model. The first impact estimate summary table corresponds to SD armor model, whereas the second impact estimates table corresponds to SDAC model. Despite the difference between SDAC and SD armor models, the comparison between the two impact estimate summary tables shows that the summary measures of direct, indirect, and total impacts of two explanatory variables x1 and x2 from the two models are very similar. The key message to be conveyed here is that two different spatial econometric models can have a very similar interpretation. Now, we summarize some analytical insights that we have gained by analyzing the Casio dataset. First, we conclude that there is a positive spatial dependence in Casio's revenue because the estimate for the parameter row in the true model is positive and significant at the 5% significance level. In other words, car sales revenue for dealership in one county affects car sales revenue in its neighboring counties. Second, we identify the true model as the model that best describes the data among all 12 models that we have considered using the AIC. Third, we find that X1 has positive and significant direct, indirect, and total impacts on car sales revenue, whereas X2 has negative and significant direct, indirect, and total impacts on car sales revenue. Moreover, an increase of X1 by one unit in all counties leads to a total increase in car sales revenue by 5.6 units. In contrast, an increase of X2 by one unit in all counties leads to a total decrease in car sales revenue by 3.2 units. To demonstrate that the C spatial reg and spatial reg procedures can scale to big data, we consider a simulated data set in our second example. In this second example, we create a spatial weights matrix W for 64,999 census tracts in a 2,000 US census based on the three nearest neighbor criterion. Using this W, we then simulate data from the true model, which is a spatial autoregressive or SAR model using the two parameters specified here. For this simulated data set, storing the full W matrix for 64,999 census tracts requires about 30 gigabytes of memory. Moreover, fitting the true model to this simulated data set using exact computation is almost infeasible. With the compact representation and two approximation methods implemented in both procedures. We can fit the true model to this simulated data set using either procedure in about a minute. As an example, we present the parameter estimates table from the true model using proxy spatial rack, which is given on the right. The comparison between the resulting parameter estimates and the true values shows that these parameter estimates are very close to the true values. To interpret the parameter estimates, we present the summary measures of direct, indirect, and total impacts for all explanatory variables from the true model. According to the impact estimate summary table, we can see that X1 has negative 
and a significant direct and indirect impact on the dependent variable y. This suggests that we would see a decrease in y in census tracts experiencing an increase in x1. The indirect effect of increasing x1 in neighboring census tracts is negative and significant at the 5% significance level. This suggests that the value of y in a census tract is negatively impacted by increasing x1 in neighboring census tracts. In addition, the total impact of x1 is negative and significant at the 5% significance level, with about one-third of this comprised of the spillover effects from x1 in neighboring census tracts. Similarly, we can interpret the summary measures of direct, indirect, and total impacts for the rest of explanatory variables. On this slide, we compare the values of the dependent variable y in the simulated data set with the in-sample predicted values from the estimated sum model. The figure on the left plots the values of y in the simulated data set, whereas the figure on the right plots the in-sample predicted values from the estimated sum model. The comparison between these two figures shows that the in-sample predicted values capture the overall pattern in the simulated data set very well. This is expected because the parameter estimates for the true model from proxy spatial reg are very close to the true values. To conclude, we introduced the spatial econometric modeling for cross-sectional data in this tutorial. Spatial econometric models address different forms of spatial dependence in the data. By including spatially lagged dependent variable, spatially lagged explanatory variables, and correlated errors in regression models. These spatial econometric models are parameterized by using spatial weight matrices that describe neighbor relationships among spatial units in the data. To fit spatial econometric models, both C-spatial reg and spatial reg procedures in SAS were discussed. These two procedures allows us to consider parameter estimation, hypothesis testing, and impact estimation for commonly used spatial econometric models. To resolve the challenges posed by big data, both C-spatial reg and spatial reg procedures support the compact representation of spatial weight matrices and two computational efficient approximation method. This slide includes most references that were cited in this tutorial. You can refer to these references if you want to know more about the topics introduced in this tutorial. Thank you for watching this tutorial. If you have any questions, you can reach me by email at guohui.wu at sars.com.